Welcome everyone to a session with Chris Stevens. We're going to focus on his paper toward fixing a framework for conformal cyclic cosmology or CCC. If CCC is what you enjoy, then I think this session will certainly be good for you. And without further ado, I think we can get started. So yeah, CCC is a, a project of, of Roger Penrose's for the last more than a decade, um, which is a is a really <laughs> a really interesting uh, take on on cosmology um, it, by exploiting a area of math that he really um, developed uh, and put forward himself in the nineteen sixties. Um, and it, it's to do with the idea of, of conformal rescalings, um, which many people probably won't know what that is, even if they are in uh, the area you know, of, of general relativity. But the idea yeah. is essentially that um, if you have an expanding universe and you make some very, very controversial assumptions on this universe, uh, <laughs> such as the the rest mass, so uh, all the all the rest mass in your universe will eventually uh, decay or get swallowed by black holes, and black holes will then eventually, uh, you know, with Hawking radiation, they'll evaporate and disappear. And mm -hmm. so in the very, very, very long-term future, um, you're really left with zero rest mass fields like photons, gravitons, things like that. And these particles with zero rest mass don't experience time, right? So the proper space-time length along their trajectories is zero. Um, and what that means is, is that you have a fundamental um, object in, in, in relativity called the, the metric, and this basically gives you everything you want to know about your space-time. And essentially, you can multiply it by some function and um, these particles are unaffected. So you have this 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 scaling degree of freedom in that, you know, um, if you go along a particle's trajectory that's got zero rest mass, it has length zero. So multiplying mm -hmm. it by a number is still going to give you a length zero, right? So you have mm -hmm. this sort of degree of freedom in multiplying your metric, which is rescaling your lengths and all of the physics just doesn't change so mm -hmm. that this is what happens in in his in his theory in the infinite future in the infinite past you have uh it's an expanding universe so if you go backwards it's contracting you have a big bang and again if you have a certain type of big bang um that paul todd from also from oxford calls uh isotropic cosmological singularity Isotropic mm -hmm. meaning that it sort of it bangs, if you like, in the same directions uh, 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 in sort of the same rate. Then you can right. do a, a this again. You can multiply your metric by a, a function, and you take out the the bang, and you and you 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 rescale it so it's a nice smooth surface. So. Mm -hmm. So you have these two sort of uh, infinite past and then uh, the, this, uh, the infinite future and then this finite past. And you have these sort of regions where you can rescale them as, as, as you like. Um, there is arguments that you can do this around the Big Bang because it's kinetic energy dominated. And so it's really the, it's, it's, it's in a conformally invariant regime as well. And so, so you have you have the Big Bang. You can sort of rescale that to a, a smooth three surface. In the infinite future, obviously things are expanding infinitely. So you can do the opposite. So instead of taking a Big Bang and, and sort of um, spreading it out, you can take this infinitely expanding universe and squish it down. Um, and mm -hmm. you in in both regimes, you end up with a very similar surface. And so okay. Penrose is essentially the, the crux of Penrose's theory is to say, well, um, I can basically write one in terms of the other one. And then you end up with sort of like if your universe is like this, you can then put another one there. So the Big Bang mm -hmm. is now attached to the future of the previous, uh, uh, what Penrose calls Eon, as we know, you know from mm -hmm. a Big Bang to the uh, infinitely expanded, and continue doing that. And you get this sort of cycles 
of time, uh, which is the cyclic cosmology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, maybe yeah. I can jump in here with a few questions. So uh, thanks mm -hmm. for the for the overview, and I can put in some uh, links in the description as well to just general talks on on CCC as well, like what the conceptuals of that is. Uh, yes. If we're focusing on the the metric for a while, so the metric yeah. and metric tensor, I suppose, are analogous in this setting, right? So would you mind yes. describing? Right. Would you mind describing a little bit more just what that contains? And um, then we'll get, I think, to what conceptually it means to scale this, like from the perspective of um, what we're actually, what claims we're actually making about space time when we do that. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, a metric is a um, an object, like you say, a tensor. Um, I don't want to go too much, you know, I'll try and keep it sort of big picture, not not too technical, right. um, but feel free to, you know, tell me to, 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 to ramble on about some technical details if we right. like. Um, but it's essentially, it is a, a quantity that describes your space time. So, um, space time is a geometry, you know, so, so, um, it is the union of, of time and space and, and gravity, uh, is, is reflected as a curvature of this geometry. And so your metric, basically, once you've got the metric, you can d derive the curvature and you can see, you know, how, how, um, gravity is um, sort of uh, shown in, in, in that space time. And so in particular, it, it can be used, you know, if you had two uh, points in your space time, the metric is used to sort of tell you what is the distance between two points, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you scale the metric by a function, then that, di that distance will scale by the function as, as well, or a square root of that. And, and and so it's you know it, it describes basically everything it, you know once you've got your metric you've got your entire space time so it is the description of the geometry mm -hmm. yeah. okay and if if we focus on scaling this function because ultimately what you're doing then is you're applying a scalar field in every point right that has one like a single value a scalar in each point for for your mm -hmm. space time and that mm -hmm. scales your uh metric Yes. What does it mean if we're scaling the if we're scaling the distances? But um, is it only the distances that we're scaling? We're scaling well. Mm -hmm. Never. Okay. Let's say we are only scaling the distances for for the moment. What does that yeah. mean when we say that we're gluing two universes together? Let's say, and we're scaling the distances in the two. Is the fundamental claim that we're making that um, we transfer from one universe, let's say, on one scale, to a universe that is a very close copy of the first one, conceptually yeah. at least, but that is exists on a fundamentally higher scale, like or are yeah, you saying good. something else? Yeah, no, I mean, good question. The, the point, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain an, an idea about the scaling and then I'll explain about the CCC um, um, implementation of that. So, um, for example, if you had the most simplest space-time possible, Minkowski space and say four dimensions, you know, keeping it as simple as possible. So that's the space-time completely flat, no curvature at all. Um, and right. you wanted to do a... a, a if you wanted to look at, for example, um, asymptotics. So Penrose, this is um, one of the, 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 the big ideas he had in the 60s, was that people are, in those days, uh, we're, you know, like Bondi and Sachs, they did some um, very influential papers on um, energy and momentum and so on in, um, in space times. They really have to look at in infinity uh, to, to classify um, notions of mass and energy and momentum and even gravitational waves, for example, because they are not locally defined in, in general relativity. Um, and and so the idea of going to infinity was very important. And so they, as you would sort of naively start with, of course, is, is do sort of expansions like 1 over R, right, where R is your radius, as R goes to infinity, that thing goes to uh, to zero, you know, so if it was the gravitational waves, for example, you would do a one over R expansion, they drop off and go to zero um, as you go to infinity, but the rate at which they change, so the, the coefficients in these expansions are very important. Now, mm -hmm. the, the main thing I'm trying to get us across here is that, you know, you have to evaluate things at infinity for many, many different sort of physical concepts in relativity. Um, and you know, limits as R goes to infinity, the radius goes to infinity is one way to do that. Penrose came up with a, a method of a conformal rescaling. So instead of instead of staying within the physical space-time 
and doing limits to infinity which are not actually in the space-time. He said, well, why don't I squish the space-time by changing the scale, um, by multiplying it by a conformal factor? And this leads mm -hmm. to what, what's called the conformal, um, conformal diagrams or Penrose-Carter diagrams that represent an entire infinite space-time in a finite picture because your length scale has changed. So um, mm -hmm. it, it, it really, it's called conformal rescaling because conformal maps preserve angles but um, change distances. So you really are doing something in all directions in the same, uh, you know, m changing the, the lengths in all directions in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why Penrose, I'm sure, has this in his brain uh, still, you know, in the 2000s when he's thinking about <laughs> cosmology. Um, and And so... The, the main idea for using this conformal rescaling for CCC is to say that near the, in the infinite future, whatever that means, or very, very, very far in the future with respect to us, um, or, very, you know, or very close to the Big Bang, um, you're in a conformally invariant regime, which means that um, the factor that you choose to rescale your metric is, does not change any physics. So, mm -hmm. so, it, so the point of, you know, saying with what, what should the rescaling be, blah, 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 um, in those two regions separately, it doesn't actually matter um, because mm -hmm. the, the equations, you know, like Maxwell equations are conformally invariant, for example, right? So mm -hmm. that means that you can, you know, and it's just due to the fact that the particles, the photons, the gravitons, these zero rest mass fields don't really experience time because the space-time length along their paths is always zero. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. we can circle back on that requirement for a second. So we said that this is a requirement to be able to scale um, the metric and have a an equivalent it's... universe, let's say, that the only particles that are left are, are the ones that um, are massless, essentially. Uh, could yeah. you elaborate on that? Why is that so important? Or like, let's say you were to apply the scaling onto our universe right now, where we have mm. particles with mass in it. What is the yep. effect of doing that? That's not, or what is not preserved if we do that? Yeah, I mean, so the Einstein equations will not be satisfied. Um, so, so the Einstein equations are the equations that restrict your metric, if you like. So, they mm -hmm. relate the geometry to the uh, energy momentum, uh, uh, you know, coming from matter and things like that in your universe. And so, um, hopefully, hopefully, probably probably in the future not exactly, but, you know, supposing that we're in a universe that satisfies the Einstein equations is looking pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if we did a conformal rescaling um, on our metric and we see, saw what the maths said, um, you know, does the new geometry satisfy the Einstein equations? Uh, the answer in general will be no, um, mm -hmm. un unless you have um, some specific... Uh, uh, um, you know, some specific um, <clears throat> uh, ass assumptions. So, for example, if you have um, that you're in a conformally invariant regime, then, you, you know, you can say that the energy momentum, um, you know, changes in a certain way, in a nice way. So, you know, if you multiply your metric by a function, um, then with these um, uh, conformally invariant um, zero rest mass fields, the energy momentum tensor um, that a appears to to govern, you know, like the um, the, the Maxwell equations or or um, you know, radiative fluids and things like that. It also is is what's called a conformal density. So it gets multiplied by a power of of this factor as well, and things just mm -hmm. just work. So so if you have mass, then none of this will will basically work because you know you you're wanting to say that the metric at the at the very far future of the universe um can is is you know you have this degree of freedom right in in this conformal factor because it's conformally invariant at that stage right so your scale doesn't matter so the you need that in order to to have this degree of freedom and then fix it in a way that then links it to the big bang of the next eon so it gives you mm -hmm. some sort of freedom to then exploit to link the two eons, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay, very good. So mm -hmm. maybe we can transition a little bit to the paper as well. Uh, I have it on the screen. Um, would you mind just summarizing what you were uh, sort of focusing on 
in this paper, um, and then we can dig into some more details on that. Yeah, so so like I said, this paper was a was an honors project of Ollie's, um, and you know my my area of research is not not in cosmology, um, but but it, it it involves you know this the the mathematics of this conformal rescaling, um, and you know the the math that Penrose uses is exactly the math that I use for other things. Um, mm -hmm. And and so it was obviously immediately interesting to me to to see this theory and and so the the point of the the honors project was for for myself <laughs> to understand you know what he's talking about and see whether there was any you know anything interesting and what we found in the literature was that um, you know there was very few uh, um, papers I think there was probably three. Right, um, by by uh, Paul Todd, uh, Ted Newman, and uh, Pavel Narovsky, um, and basically what what they were doing was trying to glue two universes together using the CCC paradigm, um, mm -hmm. and they, you know, Penrose in his book uh, Cycles of Time, had you know certain ways of doing this um, or. Um, ideas about how you would do this because the problem that this addresses at the end of the day is that you have this freedom to choose this conformal factor right um mm -hmm. to, to to then say I'm, I'm going across to my next uh to the next universe and just or the next eon and just to clarify you know because you're conformally invariant time doesn't matter that's why you can get to infinity right as soon mm -hmm. as you have rest mass you have a clock as soon as you have a clock, it it doesn't make sense to get to infinity. But in the conformally invariant regime, infinity is just another you know it's reasonable because there's no measure of of distance, right? Um, mm -hmm. So so this paper was basically looking at CCC, looking at the the literature and saying, well, um, actually everyone's doing something very similar but slightly different. Uh, <laughs> and, and we actually found a mistake in in, in Narovsky's paper, which was. Um, you know, it wasn't the main result at all. It was sort of, you know, he was doing quite a lot of other things, and this was just a, a very small section. But, um, yeah, they, they were all doing different things to Penrose, different things to each other, and it wasn't the most general way of doing it. And so mm -hmm. the plan here was to take all of their solutions, basically have a, a general solution that encapsulated all of them, and then take um, Penrose's ideas for how you choose the conformal factor um so the way that uh you would sort of think of this certainly i do numerical relativity which is evolving you know things in time mm -hmm. the way i would think about this is we're in this eon right so then i need right. so i've got my metric i need to find a conformal factor and then i'll get to the next eon right that's mm -hmm. that's the way i think of it but um a good way to start naively is to say, well, I have two reasonable universes already, or two eons already. What is the conformal factor? Can I find a conformal factor to join them? Right. Is so that a preferable approach? So I don't to think me, it seems like way... that is very. To me, yeah, it seems sorry. like very restricted. Like if if you yes. only say that we have this this one universe here, and the other one we have a lot of degrees of freedom as to how we could construct it. It seems like there's a lot of flexibility and you could simply assign a conformal factor and more or less pick a, uni uh, a universe that you would like. Like, what is the, in the grand scheme of things here, what is that we need to keep in mind in order to make this consistent when we try to evolve through the AOs? Yeah, so so this is, you know, these are the only papers on CCC, right? So baby steps. This is the sim one of the, probably right. the simplest <laughs> way to start. Um, but sure, uh, you know, if, if, if this turns out that it, you know, uh, you know, more people work on it and perhaps it's, uh, you know, some of the controversies are taken care of, which I don't think will happen. But, you know, <laughs> the, the idea definitely would be to to start from one, try and solve for a conformal factor given what you know in the current uh, eon, and then, oh, what do I get, right? I mean, that's, that's definitely the way to go. But baby steps, you sort of say, okay, um, you know, I have... Uh, FLRW, which is a simple expanding universe with a, a radiative fluid, which means that um, it's again the 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 energy momentum associated with this um, is is trace free, zero rest mass, so it satisfies some nice uh, properties. 
if you assume that you want to have those in both eons, and then you say, okay, well, obviously both must satisfy the Einstein equations. Each of these fields, if we do a conformal rescaling, rescales in a particular way. And so it is really non-trivial to say that, you know, um, these rescaled fields satisfy the Einstein equations in the new uh, eon, right? That's that's the, the hard bit. Um, mm. And so what what these people do and, and, and Ollie and I do is we, um, you know, basically solve the equations for the conformal factor um, and, and see, you know, whether it, it makes sense. You know, there are restrictions, for example. So this theory um, only works with a positive cosmological constant uh, that drives the expansion, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, having a, a FLRW, there is some, some energy momentum in there um, and the field has a, um, a particular constant in it. And so you have a cosmological constant and a constant coming from the, uh, the radius of fluid. Um, and these have to be, you know, these actually are related in a particular way. So they almost switch, switch roles, I think, uh, as, as you go through eons. So the, the, this uh, constant coming from the radius of fluid becomes the, the cosmological constant and vice versa in general. Uh, mm -hmm. when, when you do this. And so, you know, there are, there are lots of things that, that happen on this uh, crossover. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that, it, you know, the difficulty in doing the general thing of taking a space-time, finding a conformal factor and going across to an, uh, the next eon is that the trying to find a unique conformal factor is the difficulty. Um, because there is a large class of solutions to, you know, or even just, it's just completely free, right? I mean, Penrose restricts and restricts in his book, um, but it still has freedom. And in fact, he poses like half a dozen, <laughs> or I think four maybe, uh, um, ideas uh, uh, on how you would choose this, uh, this conformal factor. And Todd mm -hmm. and uh, Nerovsky have um, also different uh, approaches uh, from Penrose to, to get across with certain types of expansions. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard. Is, is, that the um, main, yeah, is, is that the main difference then in the approaches that they took? Like what approach you use to try, try and constrain the constant? Or is there something else differentiating their approaches? Yeah, I mean, so... Penrose has the argument that, um, so when you do this conformal rescaling, right, um, so your metric, mm. your geometry will uh, will be rescaled. And so you can compute from derivatives of your metric the curvature, right? So if you have, you know, your conformal conformally rescaled geometry and your physical geometry, right, mm. you can calculate the curvature quantities in both of these. And in fact, you can get um, equations that relate them. Right. So um, what he does is he does this um, a particular. So in, in, in these sorts of space times that we're interested in, a, a very common curvature quantity is called the Ricci scalar, uh, the scalar curvature. Mm -hmm. And this is equal to um, four times the uh, four times the cosmological constant when you have zero rest mass fields. And so okay. one of his postulates is that the um, that should be the same in all of the eons so so in in two eons and so what he does is you know if you have that rescaling um and you have the relationship between the ricci scalar um from the conformally rescaled metric and the ricci scalar from the physical metric the difference between the two um is a function of the conformal rescaling of the factor and its derivatives so if you know that you want these sort of to be the, you know, you want your your Ricci scalar um, to be, f you know, four times the cosmological constant or whatever, whatever it is, that restricts your um, conformal factor, right? Mm -hmm. And so that that gives you an equation for the um, for the conformal factor. So it gives you a differential equation for for the conformal factor. Um, which is called the Yamabe equation, actually. So it's it's an already studied equation that basically says, can I find a conformal rescaling of my metric that forces the Ricci curvature to be a constant? Um, mm -hmm. And and so that is his way of resolving the, you know, how do I <laughs> how do I choose my conformal factor, right? Um, right? And and you know, so so 
in solving that, so now we've restricted is essentially a complete degree of freedom to, it has to satisfy this differential equation, and then, uh, but then you need to give initial conditions, right? And, you know, so there is some more degrees of freedom there, and those are the conditions that he uh, he lays out in his book um, as, as potential conditions. And so the whole aim of this paper was to say, you know, have the most general possible CCC solution yet, um, mm -hmm. and then see which one of these, now that we have a solution, we can see, well, are these uh, uh, ideas satisfied or not, right? And really interestingly, mm -hmm. only one is satisfied. Um, so that was quite nice, I guess. That's sort of, if if you believe that this is the way to go, and there are, of course, um, other other really nice ideas from from Todd and Nerovsky and, and, and uh, Christian Lube actually is, 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 has uh, working on this at the moment, you know, the, the, this certainly picks one contender, which is exactly what you would like uh, uh -huh. to, to fix a way, um, a way forward. Mm -hmm. And the problem for the others is that with the corresponding assumptions, you're not able to satisfy the uh, Einstein's equation or, or what is the they problem, still do, so to but, speak? But they oh. still do, but they 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 um, do it in a, in a in a different way. So so Todd, for example, um, uses a Starobinsky expansion, which is a type of expansion that is um, utilized with an expanding sort of universe. Um, you know, and it it's it's the same problem. It's just it's just reformulated in in ways that may uh, illuminate how you fix the conformal factor better. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I didn't, we didn't look into those models. We, we, we started with, you know, Penrose initial assumptions or ideas. Does any of these, um, you know, for, for the model that we have that works. Um, and I think, you know, this is really it. Like there's no other models of CCC. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's just this one. And then the, you know, the sub, uh, you know, the specific cases that have been published by Todd and, 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 and Ted and so on. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, you can, you know, the, this, this, uh, con these conformal fact, this conformal factor that you get, you know, works and it satisfies these hypotheses. It, you know, and of course that the, uh, the, the metric in the next eon is of course satisfying the Einstein equations. So it's, it's all the same idea, right? You have a solution to the Einstein equations and you want to get another solution to the Einstein equations through the crossover. Um, and you know, they just repackage how you would try and fix the conformal factor in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at the end of the okay. day, it must end up with the same sort of solution. But the, the mm -hmm. hard bit is, you know, what is the motivation for choosing the conformal factor? Um, mm -hmm. That's the difficulty, I think. Okay, good. Maybe we can focus a little bit on conformal scaling as such as well, like the, the general topic of it. Um, mm -hmm. What other domains does this appear in? If you would like to paint a bit of a picture, like where the mathematics also arises, not just within the, the um, confines of CCC, but also mm -hmm. outside of that. Yeah, so... So, like I said, um, that that's my main <laughs> my main area of research is is applying right. this to, um, for example, uh, gravitational radiation, right? So, um, you know, you I'm sure you know that LIGO has detected gravitational waves uh, since 2015, uh, which is massive, um, and so what what they do is you know they have these laser interferometers on Earth, you can gravitational wave passes by from a massive event like a binary black hole merger, a neutron star merger, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. It squishes and squeezes things here, and that's picked up by the laser interferometer. And, you know, something like the, the buzzword is it can measure um, fluctuations that change length on the order of a ten thousandth the width of a proton or something, right? So, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> very sensitive. It's, a, it's amazing right. that it, it works. But uh -huh. if they want to, um, <clears throat> okay, so now they've detected a, a essentially some sort of wave. Uh, I mean, they detect the, the, the distance, uh, the length fluctuations, but, you know, you get a wave at the end of the day uh, called the strain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, what do I do with that, right? So the theoretical community say, okay, well, let's take two binary, uh, two black holes, um, you know, different masses, spins, whatever, and we do some quite hardcore numerical relativity. They coalesce, they, they merge, 
They release, when mm -hmm. they merge, they release a large uh, um, burst of gravitational radiation. Um, and the only way to sort of unambiguously define that is to get to, um, is, is to do it at infinity. And the, the, the reason for that is because when you're looking at gravitational waves, they're not like water waves, right? So a colleague mm -hmm. of mine last week gave a really nice example that you have water in a bath, right? And if you have waves in a bath, how do you measure sort of the wave? Well, you can compute the distance between the bottom of the bath and the, the surface, right? The free surface. Mm -hmm. um, but gravitational waves are not in a geometry, they, they are the geometry, right? So they are waves in the curvature of space-time. You now no longer have the bottom of the bath <laughs> to, to measure, right? The background, uh -huh. what, what is the background, right? The background includes right. is the, what, the waves. So this, this um, sort of coupling and one and the same sort of definition, um, it's really unambiguous to, or it's ambiguous to, to try and have a local notion of that. So... At mm -hmm. infinity, if you have certain assumptions of uh, your space-time, you can, uh, they're called asymptotically flat space-time. So as you go really far away, there's nothing else in the universe, for example, except the binary black holes. Things start to decay uh, and go down and, you know, gravitational waves will drop off to zero uh, in, the, in the limit. Um, but when you get to infinity, um, there you can really say, this is my background and these are my gravitational waves. Um, and the, how come you're able to do that at that limit? It's it's be, it's due to the fact that the metric itself is always flat Minkowski space, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because you know that there's nothing else in the universe as you go far away. That's what's going to happen. But quantities like like I said, if you do a one over r expansion, right, uh, of of your outgoing wave. Um, so for example. Uh, the first term uh, is something like a constant over r plus a constant over r squared plus dot dot dot, right? So when r goes mm -hmm. to infinity, that expansion goes to zero, but the coefficients in the you know a over r plus b over r squared, they cha they right. they're different, right? For each case, mm -hmm. and in fact, what uh, LIGO measures is essentially r times the outgoing gravitational wave. Right, so it picks out the first term in that expansion, uh, and it takes the constant there, or the function uh, uh, of the angular function. Uh, and, and so that's that that is the thing that's measured um, in in the numerical relativity. So it's not really the gravitational wave; it's uh, it's it's some quantity at infinity, and because these binary black hole mergers are so far away, then you know we can sort of do say that it's it's pretty pretty good to do that but from a mathematical point of view you have to be at infinity in order to make these things well defined and mm -hmm. so wrap, wrapping this up the the point is is that you know um once once you get to infinity you you have the waveform that would we we can then compare to the observations and so if you did this for lots of different um, mass ratios and spins and so on, and each of those you run it, you know, you get a waveform out um, at infinity, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, you get a template bank of hundreds of thousands of these. Then you can do some statistical analysis that, that I know absolutely nothing about. Uh, <laughs> and you, you take the observed waveform and you, you do this these fancy uh, data analysis and you say, oh, this is the waveform that best matches uh, you know, uh, the observed one from my bank of numerical templates. And then uh -huh. because you did all of the simulation, you started by prescribing the, the, the parameters, then you can say, oh, well, this waveform corresponded to a black hole of mass 32 solar masses and 48 solar masses. And so that's probably what caused the, the wave that we detected. Uh -huh. uh, so all of that, uh, process LIGO and so on rests on the fact that you're describing things at infinity, um, mm -hmm. and so so my sort of research is is looking at at that sort of uh, aspect of of the conformal rescaling version. Mm -hmm. Given that the limit to infinity is an approximation that might be justified because these are far away, um, yeah, yeah. Do we have some? like notion of how good of an approximation that is. The reason why I'm asking that is mm. the original standpoint is that 
because we're part of space time and it's the fabric itself that you have the waves in it, just as you described before, mm. if you're not, it seems to me that you don't have any sort of reference point for what the alternative would be. This approximation at infinity is the only thing that you have to deal with in the yeah. case. So do you have a, do you have any sort of notion of how accurate that is? That I, I, I wouldn't be able to answer um, because, you know, that at that point I hand off to, to others. Um, but yeah, de definitely that is, um, I, I mean, it, I think you could probably do quite a simple calculation and say, well, you know, what is the distance roughly from, you know, say a, a, an event to here that will give you an R value and, you know, the, the difference in the accuracy of the waveforms that we calculate versus the change, you know, between that large R and infinity, you can probably show that, that the, the discrepancy is within, you know, something that, that we can't resolve anyway. Um, uh -huh. So I, I, would, I would be very surprised if that was, a, 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 you know, detectable. And also, um, these numerical relativity codes don't actually get to infinity. Um, they don't do this conformal rescaling stuff, um, but again, you know, they go to what's called the wave zone, which is basically far enough, and then they do, again, these sorts of approximations when they say, well, we're close enough now. We're not at infinity, but we're close enough, and then we can do our analysis, and it shouldn't make a difference to the waveform. So I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident that they would have... <laughs> um, uh, thought about that quite quite substantially yeah i'm sure i'm sure someone has <laughs> so i'm not yeah. i'm not trying to be skeptical about it i'm just trying to wrap my head yeah, around yeah. like what you how you do that um are there if we think about the the concept of conformal uh, rescaling again uh, just outside of the field of cosmology let's say are there any um areas of application for this so we mentioned two areas of application now right tcc and and these gravitational waves but is there anything else and also like anything more distinct or, or separate from these kind of topics i mean the 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 major the major uses of obviously conformal rescaling is that you can obtain a way of getting to infinity of your physical manifold or physical space time in a finite way right and so when you do you know you bring infinity into a finite distance and so the fields that are applicable or the areas of interest that are applicable are those that are sort of w defined at infinity, right? So they mm -hmm. include things like energy, momentum, again, for similar reasons that, you know, the gravitational waves are not well defined uh, uh, locally. You know, these things, you just, you, you, you can't define them locally that, you, or at least no one has figured out a nice way to do that Uh there are lots of, mm. of work done in what's called quasi-local energy and momentum, which is, you know, trying to um, find a way to classify how much energy is in a box, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which sounds easy, but in GR, it's 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 not. Um, so really, it it is these things on on energy and momentum that uh, you know, and and also Penrose. So Penrose was at a uh, he had a. A conference in London that I went to in, in May last year at the Royal Society, which basically celebrated 60 years of, of these conformal methods. And, mm -hmm. and at the conference, and he's just released, a, the conference proceedings has just been published, I think. Um, he, he, has, he talks about what's called Newman-Penrose constants. So those are quantities defined on at infinity, um, in particular, um, at the end, if you follow light rays off to infinity, that gives you a nice surface at infinity, which uh, these are well defined at. And they are, in nonlinear GR, they are 10 numbers, uh, 10 real numbers that are absolutely conserved, which means that um, <clears throat> if you follow light rays all the way out to infinity, and you do that for every light ray, you get a a, a null hypersurface, so you get a hypersurface that intrinsic their lengths are all zero it's three-dimensional okay. and its topology is r cross s2 which is like a cylinder but the circle that gives you the cylinder is now a two sphere right uh -huh. um and what what you find is really interesting is that he gives if you fix the r so you basically say take a cut of the cylinder you have this integral over it which is conformally invariant 
which means that if it's conformally invariant, it is independent upon the rescaling that you used, which means it's physical, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, you're introducing a degree of freedom. In, if you have mass, for example, you're introducing a degree of freedom in your equations um, by rescaling your, your, your metric. And then if you're using this rescaled metric, why should it be physical uh, unless, uh, you know, you're in the CCC regime where you've only got zero rest mass fields. But around a black hole, of course, you would not have that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so you get these integrals that are physical integrals. And no matter which cut you make, so which slice of this, of this sort of cylinder type uh, uh, surface at infinity you take, these numbers will always be the same. And in, in, in a simplified setting, he, can sh he showed that these are actually related to uh, physical quantities. Um, so they tell you something about the physical information, which is really interesting. Um, and even if, you know, you had uh, the binary black hole collision and then there was a massive um, burst of gravitational radiation and, you know, you're taking cuts and the, the radiation came through, it wouldn't, you know, all of the variables that are used to, to do this uh, integral to get these numbers, they all completely change, but they change in such a way that the, the number is the same, which is, which is really interesting. Um, and so he, he's got a paper on, on, on this that's just come out as a new way of interpreting it. Uh, this, this has been around six, since the 60s. He called the Newman-Penrose constant, but no one has mm. been able to um, ascertain their sort of physical relevance in the in a general setting, um, and so that's something that I've been looking at with with uh, with another student, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is you know that's really interesting. Um, How do you approach trying to get some clarity in that? Like, where do you start? So, so given the, or the the research that you did, like, what is it focused on particularly to try and uh, make heads from tails and 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 that mess? Yeah, so I mean, all I I'm pretty sure I can say all of the. Um, all of the research that has gone into the Newman Penrose constants are completely analytical, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that limits, I mean, not to bag people that do that, of course, but you know, um, you can you can go a lot further with numerics um, without simplifying assumptions and things like that. You know, you can bang it out in full generality, for example. So mm -hmm. we have a um, so collaborator Jurg Frandina and I um, in the last sort of. Oh, it's making me feel old, but almost in the last decade, uh, have developed a framework to solve the uh, Einstein equations, not in the physical space-time, but on this rescaled space-time. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we've been testing it with is a, we have a black hole. We shoot a gravitational wave at the black hole. Um, it, you know, gets wobbled about a bit and releases yep. some gravitational radiation out to infinity. And that gives us sort of a non-trivial test case um, for mm -hmm. things like energy momentum, angular momentum, um, the newman penrose constants, all that uh, at infinity. And, and so what we've been doing is, uh, is a paper uh, that's just been accepted finally <laughs> early this year um, uh, with, with Jörg and with uh, Alex Gudenbauer, who was a master's student of mine. Um, mm -hmm. And we do it in full three plus one, so four full dim four dimensions, uh, completely nonlinear. So we don't do any assumptions on the equations. We it's no assumptions um, other than we're in you know this sort of asymptotically flat regime. Um, mm -hmm. And in in this case, if you choose your ingoing gravitational wave in a particular way, you'll excite all ten of these modes, all ten of these uh, these Newman Penrose constants, I should say, and. So one thing that we're we're just working on now with it with it with a PhD student uh, is to say well if we can classify you know the gravitational wave has this sort of energy this sort of in, uh, angular momentum or or linear momentum coming in if we can do that mm -hmm. in a nice way and then we see oh this is the corresponding Newman Penrose constant um, then you know what if we increase the energy a little bit what 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 mm -hmm. changes right oh you know out of these 10 numbers one of them might be quite sensitive to changes in energy or, or you know or change the angular momentum slightly what happens you know and we can kind of perhaps piece together the parameter space 
uh, of that situation and how it influences these numbers um, mm -hmm. uh, to see whether or not, you know, they definitely contain physical quantities and whether or not we can sort of say anything about the space time by computing these quantities. Um, that's, that's the idea. Right. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, we should start wrapping up. So I think given that you're talking briefly about like ongoing research, looking forward and, and research that you're doing that you would be interested in conducting in the future in this mm. space or potentially like adjacent to this, um, do you have anything right now that you're, that you would like to look at? Yes. So, so my, my major thing that I'm working on now is, is gravitational wave scattering. Um, mm -hmm. so, so this is, you know, scattering problems, uh, a nice example is, you know, um, sunlight scatters off a, 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 a raindrop and creates a rainbow, for example. So, you know, right. you have some in-states, they come in, they interact with either themselves or some other object, and then they leave. And, and the, the aim of a scattering theory is to relate the in-states to the out-states directly, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, in, you know, Maxwell equations, electromagnetism, it's linear, you have a matrix that relates your in-states to your out-states. Right. Nobody has done gravitational scattering. Um, and the reason is because, you know, you have to get to infinity, asymptotic past, asymptotic future, because it's a non-linear theory, as soon as you introduce a gravitational wave, for example, if it's going this way, it non-linearly mm -hmm interacts with itself so it's self-interaction really interesting um and it will mm -hmm. release uh gravitational radiation going in the opposite direction and then that one interacts with itself and and does that and <laughs> you know and, and it, you can see why things get complicated so you really uh -huh. have to get to infinity to have them completely decoupled from each other and mm -hmm. that's the issue is that not many people incorporate say this will be done uh, numerically again um, numerical codes that incorporate infinity to even start doing this. So mm. uh, I, I received with with Jörg Frandina a, a, a three year grant uh, at the start of, at the end of last year that will kick off this year, um, looking into such a thing where you know you you can prescribe sort of not not arbitrary but you know um, reasonably arbitrary ingoing wave profiles. On the mm -hmm. infinite past, where it's very well defined, you numerically solve the the equations. They come in, you know, they interact with either themselves or each other or a black hole. They mm -hmm. leave, and then you read off what the gravitational radiation w is on the infinite future. And that problem has been talked about. Um, Friedrich talk, talked about it. Helmut Friedrich is a very prolific uh, a relativist in this area of rescaling uh, in the 80s, for example, and he said, you know, this is really interesting, you, you can do this and this and this to set up your initial waves and so on, um, but no one's be, been in a position to really explore it because it's difficult to get to infinity. So mm -hmm. so the the major uh, research uh, idea that that my group and uh, uh, is 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 working towards is to have a fully global scattering problem for gravitational waves and see mm -hmm. how they interact with each other and whether there is anything fundamental in the physics that no one has sort of detected yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so am I right in extrapolating that? Let's say you're not in the the infinity limit and you have a gravitational wave in this domain. Mm -hmm. Due to its self-interacting nature, there's no such thing as le like just imagining a flat wave, let's say, through space-time. That doesn't exist unless you're in the infinite regime. I, I mean, if it even exists there. But there's no, like, is that conclusion right from, from what you just said? Yeah, I mean, there are cases. So, so for example, you, you usually have two functions, which is sort of like, if imagine you were outside a black hole and you shone a torch, right? The light could either go into the black hole or it could go away from it, right? So uh -huh. if you imagine that these two, two directions are two functions and, you know, each function represents a, a gravitational wave going in those two directions. So right. as I said, the self-interaction basically means that one will cause the other one to, to generate and, and vice versa. There are simple simple situations that this doesn't occur, um, but mm -hmm. they so the only exact solutions for the nonlinear uh, gravitational wave scattering are they assume plane symmetry. Um, okay. So so that is already a huge assumption, and 
it basically it has pathologies like future singularities and and these things um, that that we mm. want to avoid. But in that case, you can get away with gravitational nonlinear gravitational waves propagating without generating this this uh, it's called back reaction generating another another gravitational wave. But they are highly idealized situations, and the the wave profiles are given by like delta functions. Um, so it's mm -hmm. it's not really um, you you can only take that so far, right? I mean, there are exact solutions, yeah. which is great, but if you wanted, you know, an ensemble of waves of of a of an arbitrary profile, then you're completely out of luck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Um, mm -hmm. From your side, is there anything else you would like to like include before we wrap up the discussion? No, I, I think that those questions um, sort of covered quite a lot of uh, interesting topics and. Uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm happy with with that for sure. Okay, cool. Then I think we can close it here. Thanks a lot, Chris, for for joining. Cool. Thank you.